pause as we welcome our political leader, Mayor Amor Motley. Harry Russell, who may better be known as Wild Coot, <laughs> and who every Monday continues to play a role in educating the people of Barbados at this very difficult time of our existence. And I want to thank also preeminent hotelier and tourism expert, Mr. Ralph Taylor, for allowing us to get off the ground these people's assemblies. And we are here not as a branch meeting, not as a political public meeting, but as a people's assembly because it is the people's business which concerns us. And it is the people of Barbados who have been put on the front line and who will face the burden of the cuts and the sacrifice, decisions being made in their name without any hope whatsoever of seeing light at the end of the tunnel. And our people have known what it is to bear sacrifice. Our people have known what it is to cut and contrive. Our people have known what it is to have to stoop to conquer. But we have never before, since being in charge of the affairs of our country, we have never before been asked to make a sacrifice for no reason whatsoever. And that is the dastardly nature of the crisis that this country now confronts. I came into public life in 1991. I stood up in Hathersall Turning. I was in the next gap by Spud the Butcher, for those who know Spud. When I heard Erskine Sandiford vow to the people of the Turning and wider Barbados that there will be no layoffs of people in the public service and that there will be no cuts when Henry Ford got in Market Hill and read from the IMF a document that said that the country was in crisis and that we would be in the hands of the IMF. And they pilloried Henry Ford. They called him a liar. They said that the economy was batting stronger than Gary Sobers. Do you remember that? I can't hear you. And less than nine months later, I sat in the Senate of Barbados as one of two opposition senators with Tyrone Barker. And the government of Barbados brought legislation and a mini budget to cut people's salaries by 8% and to send home 4,000 people. And the people went to the streets. And the people went to the streets because they felt betrayed more than anything else. And the betrayal was born out of commitments given by a government that all was well. But you know the fundamental difference between 1991 and now? That in 1991, people had savings in the bank account. Businesses were still strong. And more importantly, when Mr. Sandiford asked you to make the sacrifice, it unlocked funds from the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the Inter-American Development Bank. Today, we are being told that 3,000 workers must go home on top 
of the 390 from the drainage unit and the 10 from education and the few from all of the other ministries that have already gone. But the difference is that it will not unlock a single cent to help the government of Barbados restructure and reposition this economy. The difference is that that cut in 1991 was sufficient to cure the problem. The difference is that today, what Chris Sinclair and Frandell Stewart are proposing will not even solve one twelfth. You hear me? One how much? I can't hear you. Because you must remember, will not even solve one twelfth of the problem that the government of Barbados faces. And I want to thank Clyde Masker. Clyde, come inside, sir. Come inside. I want to thank Clyde Masker for helping me carry the weight. Because, because the truth is that Mr. Sinclair tells you and has the whole country believing for the last month that if he can solve this problem by sending home 3,000 workers and if he can solve this problem by cutting $150 million, 143 to be precise, that we would be back on the road to safety. The same day that Chris Sinclair spoke, the IMF released a press release. And the IMF told the country that even after sending home or saving that amount of money, sending home 3,000 workers, Barbados would face a deficit of 9.5%, which is worse than the 9% Chris Singler told you in August that forced him to action. I'm taking my time because you need to understand that even after sending home 3,000 workers, the Barbados government will have a deficit, will have less money coming in, more money to find than what it thought it would have had to find in August five months ago. And Clyde will tell you that our deficit after we deal with the loans is virtually a billion dollars overall. Not million, billion, 900 odd million and change. And when you take out government's capital program, the money that you spend on buildings, what is left is what you need to pay every month, salaries, buy goods, pharmaceuticals, spare parts for the transport board, fuel, all of those things, that we would still be 700 million short. And that is why the hospital is on the verge of collapse because of a lack of money. And all who want to hear more about it, come Tuesday night at the People's Assembly at Foundation at 7 o'clock when Jerome Walker will tell you the facts. That is why the drug companies are only giving the QEH essential drugs for dialysis, for cardiac, and for one or two other areas. And that is why Chris Sinclair will come with a supplementary for the hospital and the transport board and the university for almost $200 million before the end of this month. So you are sending home 3,000 workers or 2,500 in your footsie deal. But you've got to turn around and find just to keep things going. And I say tonight in this people's assembly that the rot must stop and it is time for the government of Barbados to go.
I say tonight that there will be no freeing of the future of the people of Barbados unless we have a government that stops playing footsie, that stops hiding from the facts. How many more people must tell this government to come clean? Today, Sir Alan Fields is on the back page making the same request that the Barbados Labour Party has been making for now the longest time. Charlie Skeet, Terence Farrell, every single commentator, every single individual. And that is why the Labour Party will hold people's assemblies because it's not about our voice alone. It is about the voice of the people now. And the voice of the people must be heard in this country because this is about people's lives. This is not about an election or who win. This is not about playing footsie. This is about whether my constituents, your aunt, your uncle, your mother, your father, your daughter will have a job. This is about whether they will be able to pay their rent or their mortgage. This is about whether they can afford to go and get an x-ray to see whether they have a medical condition that they can solve instead of having to subject themselves to time and ultimately to death. This is about people's lives. And I have come to tell you that I have not come to public life for post, position, nor power. I have come to public life to represent people. And therefore, there is no poll, there is no power, there is no principality that can get in the way between me and the people of Barbados now and doing for them that which is their due. I have come to speak truth to power. And in speaking truth to power, I say to you tonight that the actions being taken by this government day by day are threatening the existence of businesses and households and families. The Canadian High Commission had more Barbadians applying to it to go overseas to live and work than they've had in a long time in the last few months. Young people are asking for opportunities because they cannot get any in the land of their birth. There are people working as receptionists in phone companies who have master's degrees. There are people in this country who are eating breadfruit day in and day out because that is the only thing that they can get without having to pay money for. There are people in this country who know they should go and get a mammogram. I'm not asking you and who have a loud cyst in the breast to get to so large that no doctor needs to tell me that that cancer has spread to the lungs or the liver. This is the Barbados that we are now living in. And the 14 people in the Labour Party will do our job. But we can only say to the people of this country, we are awaiting your signal. Because it is you, the people, that will determine what kind of Barbados you live in. It is you, the people, that will determine whether enough is enough. Yesterday, I spent my time in Brunsville and in the Pine. Yes, Auntie, I was up in the Pine. And I was in Brunsville. And there were people there appealing to me that they couldn't take it anymore. They don't understand this thing about the government got five years because to them the constitution don't make no sense. And I had to explain to them that that's what the constitution says. But I say to you tonight that the pressure must be put to bear on every single parliamentarian in the parliament of Barbados not to stand up for the party, not to stand up for themselves, but to stand up for the people of Barbados. And I say this with all sincerity because we are at the edge 
I want you to follow me on the process. I told you at the beginning that this government is sending home 3,000 people without unlocking a single cent to restructure this economy. Do you understand that? We have lost 10,000 jobs in the private sector in the last five, six years. This government has taken on 4,000 jobs in the public sector in the last five years. And all that the government is doing is trying to correct the excesses in the public sector that they committed in the last four years. But when they finish that, Ralph, the private sector and Harry are in the same condition where they are not earning. If they were earning, we would not now have the unusual position, the unusual distinction of having 24 straight months of decline in the most important sector, tourism. The only country that did worse than Barbados last year, year before, was a country where two-thirds of the population had to be evacuated. Montserrat. And last year, as if that was not, we were not to outdo that, to reward Richard Seeley for his monumental achievement of carrying Barbados to the bottom of the path, Frondel Stewart reappoints him and Richard Seeley does not disappoint and gives us another year of straight decline, month by month by month. He gave them, as Cynthia is reminding me, help in the form of Irene Sandy for Garner. Garner. And she has now helped him keep tourism at the bottom. This country will not recover if tourism is floundering. And that is why our foreign reserves continue to dip, 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 and go down, down, down. And even after the government has taken in the $300 million from the Credit Suisse loan, at the most rapacious of conditions, the reserves have started to decline again. Because the underlying problems confronting the economy are still there. So no matter how much you give a man some water to stop him from being thirsty and he got cancer, the cancer is what is killing you. And the bottom line is that that Credit Suisse loan will buy us two to three months. No more. And what we have now in the economy is a panic that has been set upon us not by the opposition, not by the opposition, but by a Minister of Finance telling you over and over that the reserves declined because there was no confidence in the economy. That's what he told you in August in the budget. And a Prime Minister continuing to remain silent as if he is not any part of this country. I'm not going to call him a dead. He is the Prime Minister. And none of us in this room can imagine 12% of the public service of the United States of America being sent home without Barack Obama talking to the people of the United States of America. None of us in this room can imagine 12% of the British public service being sent home without the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom talking to the people. But in Barbados, we have not only seen it, we are accepting it because we have said nothing to let Mr. Stewart know that he has a duty to lead from in front and to talk to his people. What has been going on is not right. People believe that this 3,000 people will get them to safety. It will not. And in the same way I told you in August, let us wait and see. 
and you waited and saw, and what happened? August statement became irrelevant, and a new statement came in December. August statement replaced the revised medium-term fiscal strategy. That failed too. The revised medium-term fiscal strategy replaced the medium-term fiscal strategy. That failed too. How many more plans must fail? How many more people must lose their jobs? How many more people must lose their houses? How many more people must leave to go overseas to find a better way? How many more households must break up over money? How many more businesses must close before the people of Barbados say enough I cannot hear you. Enough. I cannot hear you. Enough. How many more people must go before the people say enough is enough? And I say to the people of this country, your silence is the government's greatest ally. Your silence is the government's greatest ally. And we have reached a position where the desperation is so great. Ronald Toppin gave us a wonderful line. He took the line from Sparrow, Gene and Dinah, for those who remember. When you catch them broken, you can get it all for nothing. And before our very eyes, we see everything going for nothing. Ralph, you said 50 million would have done you wonders at Amman. But this government has now committed to giving Amman far more than 50 million through sandals at Casarina in St. Lawrence. And now committing to make an investment of $600 million when the government of Barbados is already one of the 10 most indebted countries in the entire world. And when even Grenada, little Grenada, the government said, no, we are not building a hotel for you, Mr. Stewart. If you can't get the private sector to bill it for you with something got to be wrong. And in Grenada, the private sector built the Sandals Hotel, which is now open last month in Grenada. But the people of Barbados, with a government that is more desperate than desperate, broken, selling it all for nothing, giving Sanders incentives that make no sense because when your children go to compete with them for a job, your children have to spend the salary on a car with duty. Your children have to spend the salary on household improvements that they pay duty on. But the likes of sandals, the likes of carib cable, the likes of costuless. And if you thought it was done, wait for this one, Jerome. The money that the Queen Elizabeth Hospital owes Brydens for the drugs. I want the Minister of Finance to tell this country whether he is going to and has advised Brydens that they will get their money through his waiving the duties and import duties for all that Brydens brings in because the government has no money to pay Brydens for the drugs that the Queen Elizabeth Hospital has bought it. I want Chris Sinclair to level with the country as Alan Fields told us. Because understand what that means. It means that a company that is a competitor to Brydens that cannot get the duty free will have to sell the goods to you at a higher price and you, because you don't got no change in your pocket, gonna to go to Brydens and left out all the other companies that compete with Brydens for the same goods. You cannot run a tax system that way. The first principle of taxation is that you cannot discriminate. 
that the same people must benefit from the same taxes in the same circumstances. Fairness, non-discriminatory. And then, in trying to help Brydens, because I ain't blaming Brydens, because the government should have paid Brydens for the drugs every long time since, instead of paying for David Thompson football tournament, or instead of paying caterers that belong to a Democratic Labour Party for summer camps. Because the people in the hospital need the drugs. And Brydens should not have to wait the length of time that they are waiting to be paid. But what you do then, is that suppose some of the competitors to Brydens are barely hanging on and working on an overdraft. From the time now Brydens can offer the goods at half the price, those competitors now bang, over the cliff. Gone. Lick up. More private sector jobs gone. So that even if you argue that the government trying to pay Brydens to get more drugs for the hospital to save people's lives, they're doing the wrong thing in the wrong way. And it will have worse consequences for the people of this country. But let us come to January 12th. Tomorrow is the 13th, Tuesday is the 14th, Wednesday is the 15th. And those of you who listen to the radio today heard me say, stop playing footsie. Stop playing footsie with the emotions and the minds of the workers of this country. Chris Sinclair told this country on the 13th of December, one month ago tomorrow, that this country had no choice but to send home 3,000 workers. You heard him? You heard him? And he told the country last Monday that it was government policy and that he had no discretion and that he had to do it to defend the Barbados dollar and the fixed exchange rate. And now we are hearing that after Sir Roy Trotman wrote them a pistol ball of a letter, that all of a sudden, the government is going to shave off 500 jobs and find another way after he told you that this country cannot take no more taxation, either new or additional taxation. Now I have to ask myself, because I am getting in, because I've told you from day one that a debate about 3,000 jobs is a false debate and that I am not in any butcher's carnage with the government of Barbados. That if the government of Barbados needs restructuring, let us do it in a systematic way. That structure follows function. That you have a structure of government to carry out certain functions. That a government is about law and order. Therefore, it needs a police force. That a government is about keeping people's health in good shape and making sure we don't suffer from public health outbreaks. So you need to spend money on health care. That people in Barbados come from a background where the majority of us did not have access to money and it is education that has lifted us and therefore education in the context of a government of Barbados is a most important function. That the beaches and the coasts and the gullies and the roads need to be fixed if you don't get floods, if you're not to be flooded out and to lose everything you have and to allow people to transport goods in good time and good order. And that what binds us above all else is that we are Barbadians. So you must defend the interests of a country called Barbados. That is what government is to do. Now if we had a sensible discussion about the restructuring of government, rather than pulling a figure from a hat to meet an American Airlines 3 o'clock Miami flight before the IMF delegation left Barbados so that you could get a good report card, but they still will not get that good report card. Because separate from the deficit, separate from the mob of ton of money that they owe, 
There's a whole set of other money owed to people over $800 million. And when you add the 800 and the 900 million, our debt, immediate debt, not our overall debt, but the government of Barbados for day-to-day -day bills or everybody in town to the point where there's a level of shame now brought on this country, but more importantly, that we are broke. When the unions and the government meet tomorrow, any reduction of numbers cannot be about pulling here and pulling there because you have started wrong. And how all of a sudden that which you couldn't do last week and you couldn't do last month, you can now do unless you are putting your interests first and not the country's. Stop playing footsie with the people of this country. Because when you still send them home, how are you going to finance the deficit? That remains. And if you can't finance it, if you can't borrow to pay your bills as you have been doing, that is when the central bank starts to print money. And in this year alone, 50% of government's deficit thus far has been financed by the central bank, printing of money. Moody's told us straight, if the reserves continue to fall, and if you continue to print money, there will be another downgrade. Do you understand that the problem is not that the country is broke? You understand that Barbados got money, but it is the government of Barbados that broke? You understand that the banks have money, but the banks cannot lend the government anymore because they have reached the limit that they are allowed to lend the government. And therefore, what we have is a madness taking place and a government whose word you cannot trust. Because one week in August, you're sending home people. Next week, Frandel says, no, we're going to see how we can find the savings. Next week in October, Frandel says, we found the savings, 13th of October. By December, Chris tells you, no. 3,000 got to go now. And now, last week he says, they still have to go. And before the end of the week, they tell you, well, some might stay. <laughs> now, what kind of circus, what kind of mad people you have in government in this country? And no wonder, Nobody wants to lend us money. Nobody has confidence in us. And I am saying to you now that nothing will change because there is no confidence in the Prime Minister. There is no confidence in the Minister of Finance. And let me send a clear warning for those, I don't even know what to call them, those childish messages from Chris Sinclair about pay cuts and legislation. Let this government understand that, and this is my view, and we will take it to the councils at the appropriate time. But let them understand that it is my view that you cannot ask the Barbados Labour Party to give you a mandate for a pay cut that the people of Barbados did not give you in February last year. You went to an election. And you told the people in the election, no layoffs. You told the people of Barbados, no sell-offs. You won a government on the basis of what? No layoffs, no sell-offs. Well, I tell you, it was the biggest rip-off. And now, you want all of us to wipe that from our brain. Forget that you lied to us. Forget that you ripped us off. And expect that you can lead us to safety. But the first thing you do when a man comes to save you in the water, and you drowning, you got to trust him. 
But if you don't trust him, you ain't holding on to him. And that is the problem that this government faces. That people do not trust them. People do not have confidence in the Prime Minister or the Minister of Finance. And there is no economic solution to a loss of confidence. None. None. So ladies and gentlemen, understand that we can, however long you want to take to get to the point, Barbados will not grow until Chris and Frandel go. You can take as long as you want. You can take as long as you want to tell Mia and the BLP that you are ready. But remember what I tell you tonight on the 12th of January. Barbados and you will not grow unless Chris and Frandel go. And regrettably, regrettably, instead of people putting the interests of the people first, the government puts its interests first. The unions are seeking to score a victory by how many they reduce rather than carrying us to safety as a country and as workers. And there are politicians who must now ask themselves one by one, including me, all 30 of us, whose interests must we serve? I am here tonight, as is the rest who are here, to tell you that we serve the interests of the people of Barbados. And some of what I say and have said tonight may not please the government, may not please the private sector, may not please the unions. I respect you all, but I am not here to please you. I am here to represent the people of Barbados. And we are not going to do anything reckless. And let me share this now for the first time with the public. When Chris Sinclair was going to deliver the budget speech last year, August, you would know that we had the reserves. We knew the reserves had fallen by $300 million. And for three nights, couldn't sleep, agonize, because we felt that as a responsible opposition, that that was not the kind of thing that we should go on the front foot and tell the people of the country because of the impact that it would have on banks and capital markets that the government of Barbados would have to rely on to borrow. And whether we like it or not, it's not about us getting into government, it's about people keeping their jobs and being able to live and li keep their houses and all of that. And we agreed that I would not raise it in my reply to the budget. That we would find a different way to talk about the lack of confidence in the country and in the government, but we would not highlight to the world that our reserves had fallen $300 million in three months. Ask Dale, ask all of the rest, Cynthia, all of the rest, Owen. We were the most shocked people when within a half hour of starting his speech, Chris Sinclair said that the reserves had dropped by 300 million because of a lack of confidence in the government of Barbados and the economy of Barbados. Merkin, that is like you going to a doctor and before you get in the room, the doctor tell you, the last three patients I see get killed here. That is like a man going into the dock, Eric, and saying guilty as charged. You don't have no verbal. That is a written confession because the budget is written. 
three nights we couldn't sleep because we felt that it would be an act that would destabilize this country. And the one person whose responsibility it is to protect this economy, the one person who was in charge of the economy for the three years previous told the people of the world, not the people of Barbados alone, that we were now in free fall. And that being in free fall, he thought was because there was no confidence in the government. Now, if you have an investor coming to you, Hashem, and they read that statement the week before, you think they're coming to buy land or a hotel in Christchurch? I'm gonna study yourself. If you had an investor, Eddie, coming to buy a hotel on the West Coast, and the Minister of Finance told you, Ralph, that Barbados was in a position where it could not defend its reserves because people didn't have confidence in the economy. This was not James Paul speaking. This was not the market vendor speaking. This was the Minister of Finance. And what happened since then? You know that between the 31st of March and just before the loan was received at the end of December, our reserves went from $1.47 billion to $841 million under this government. And the only reason he could tell you that it was at $1.14 billion last week is because of the $300 million that they got with the loan and it has started to decline again. We do not have time. I am going to say it. I can't make you believe it. When I told David Thompson in March 2008, 2009, sorry, he came to the parliament and Cynthia will tell you, he told us that he was going to run a deficit of 5%. And I know the figures in the estimates because I have served in the economic sector, in the social sector, in the governance sector, I know the estimates backwards. And I told David Thompson on the floor of the house that the lowest this deficit could be was eight to eight and a half percent. The deficit came in at 8.7%. Chris keeps telling you that he brought down a deficit in 2011. Why you don't tell the truth, no? Why you don't tell you that the only reason the deficit was down is because they pushed the money on the national insurance scheme to pay $130 million for the transport board, for the hospital, for the tourism authority, and for UWI. Why doesn't he tell you that the reason the government has $800 million in arrears and counting, don't get tired with the deficit, that's what they haven't brought to book yet. That's in the atmosphere floating about. You want me to tell you what it is? 200 million in VAT returns at the end of May. <coughs> 200 million to UWI. And if the other 60 million that they owe for this year is not paid by the end of March, it will be 260 million. 30 million for the transport board at the end of September. 30 million for the Barbados Tourism Authority. 10 million for the Water Authority to Light and Power alone. 70 million to Barack. 50 million to the Williams Group. I can go on and on. Well, no, don't even put in Clico in there. Because they're treating Clico as pure debt. That is another 375 million that will come on $14 billion of debt, carrying our debt to in excess of 170% of GDP. In fact, it is at 165, and if you add Clico, you are going to carry it to over 200% of GDP. 
Listen, I am telling you, I am telling you, we have been consistent and everything that we have said has come to pass. I am not asking people to believe me now, but I am asking people to leave these people's assemblies this week and to study their future. You don't know how the organizations work. If you want to ask Sandy Crest for help because somebody faints here and you feel they're having a heart attack, you have to take into account the time that it takes for the person to pack up at Sandy Crest get in the car, drive down here, and save the person. If you intend to get help from anybody in this economy, it's not going to happen overnight. And the process will take at least three to four months, during which you don't get sent one. So why are you going to wait till this economy is on its feet, till we are naked, till we are broken, to ask for the help that we need to allow us to breathe, to restructure this economy, and to save Barbadian lives, and to save Barbadian savings, and to save Barbadian jobs, and to save Barbadian businesses. This is the last going down. And I am not going to be distracted by not a fellow. I am not going to be distracted by not a man. I am not going to be distracted by not a woman. I am not going to be distracted by not a boy, not a girl. Because I have nothing left to prove. I am here simply to tell you that this country's only asset is stability. Monetary stability, macroeconomic stability, social stability, political stability, our only asset on 166 square miles is stability. When you lose that stability, all the Trinidadians that want to come and live here to get away from the crime, they're not coming. When you lose that stability, all of the British that have been paying money in the hotels and the villas, where are they coming? Not to Barbados. When you lose that stability, all the things that you take for granted, that you go about and do as a woman at night without worrying about somebody walking with you to protect you as you enter your house, you can't do. When you lose that stability, even the political stability, the reasons that people want to come to Barbados is because of that stability. And this government, as God is my witness, as God is my witness, has us on the brink. Some people are suffering, but not all. And therefore people think we have the luxury of time. But when you add in the timelines to do the things, and don't mind about these projects that they're telling you about. Well, I'm a lawyer, and I can tell you that the projects that the government is relying on all have a timeline. And the timeline, how am I, Ralph Sanders, to help the Barbados economy now? It takes two to three years to build out the hotel. It takes two years for a cruise pier to build. It takes two years if the sign releases. It takes time, Jerome, for a sugar factory that you still don't know that you need and you're going to take up $500 million that you don't have to build. This is all smoke and mirrors. And the only thing that is holding them is the consent and the silence of the people of Barbados. I am not asking you to do anything illegal. But I believe that the Lord gave us a voice for a reason. And I believe that W.E.B. Du Bois and others told us that we must speak truth to power for a reason. And I believe that Nelson Mandela lived for a reason. And Martin Luther King lived for a reason. 
and others have shown that it is possible where oppression exists and where hope is not there for people to stand up and to say enough is enough. And I say to you tonight, the Barbados Labour Party and certainly all who are in Parliament are listening because we believe that so long as the people of Barbados say enough is enough and so long as the people of Barbados this is not about the union movement or the union leaders this is not about title holders to organizations this is about people's lives and if people can't make it and if you believe me that there is a better way and we will share that better way with you but I am not going to give the government the luxury every time we have offered to cooperate it has gotten me in trouble it even get me in trouble in the Labour Party every time and I say to you now Barbados will not grow until Chris and Frandel go and you don't have to ask what our agenda is and the longer we take to get there the worse the conditions will be the more people will fall and I pray every night that we can get there because one of the problems of a devaluation is that we lose stability and if we lose stability it is like virginity you don't get it back It's a fact. So I ask you to be on your mark. To be on your mark. I ask you to come out to these people's assemblies. On Tuesday, we go to foundation school. And in addition to the speakers like Jerome and Maria and others, there will be also our invited guests of Bishop Wood, Bishop Wilfred Wood, the distinguished first black bishop in the United Kingdom, and Dr. Peter Laurie, the former head of the Foreign Service of Barbados. On Thursday at 7 again, we go to St. Leonard School, and we have invited David Comijon. He leads a different political party, but we have the same interests called Barbados. And I've invited Harold Hoyt, who will also come to speak on Thursday. And next Sunday, I will do a State of the Nation address at Sherburn. And we will broadcast it live to the country. God willing, and on the internet. And we will set out our perspective on what the state of Barbados is. We do not have the constitutional power to call an election because if you know if we did, it would have been called already. But we know that we have the power of the voice and we know we have the power of the feet and we know we have the power to say to this government, you don't have to listen to us, but you're gonna get tired hearing us because enough is enough, is enough, is enough, is enough. And I ask all who believe in this country, all who want to stand for their families in this country, join us on this train because we are intent on doing what we have to do to save this country because for Barbados to grow, Chris and Frandel must go. Good night and God bless. <laughs>